Hey everyone, today we're diving into the interesting history of the Kingdom of Kush, a powerful ancient civilization that once thrived in what is now modern-day Sudan. This isn't just any old history lesson, it's a journey through time to a kingdom that was as rich in culture as it was in gold. So let's set the scene. The area we now call Kush, and later known as Nubia, has been inhabited for thousands of years, but the actual kingdom of Kush didn't really come into its own until much later. We're talking about a time around 2500 BCE, when the Kerma culture, named after the city of Kerma, started to flourish. This culture was closely connected to ancient Egypt, and they were in contact from the very early days of Egyptian history. Fast forward to around 1069 BCE, and Egypt was no longer the powerhouse it once was. This gave Kush, specifically the city-state of Napata, a chance to rise to power. With Egypt struggling, the Kushites didn't have to worry about being invaded, so they established their own kingdom with Napata as their capital. And guess what? They became the dominant force in the region while Egypt was trying to sort itself out. The Kushites were so powerful that their kings even became pharaohs of Egypt during the 25th dynasty. Kushite princesses also played a major role in Egyptian politics, especially in Thebes, where they held the influential title of God's wife of Amun. One of the first Kushite kings, Kushta, took control of the Egyptian throne around 750 BCE and appointed his daughter, Aminerdi's I, as the first Kushite god's wife of Amun. This Kushite rule continued until the Assyrians invaded Egypt in 666 BCE. But the story doesn't end there. In 590 BCE, the Egyptian pharaoh Semeticus sacked Napata, so the Kushites moved their capital to Merol. This city became the heart of the kingdom, which continued to thrive until around 330 CE, when the Axumites invaded and destroyed Meroe. By then, overuse of the land had already weakened Kush, and the kingdom was on its last legs. It finally came to an end around 350 CE. Now, let's talk about what this kingdom was actually called. The Egyptians referred to it as Tasiti, meaning, the land of the bow, because of the skilled archers from Kush. The northern part near Egypt was known as Wawat. What the people of Kush called their land is a bit of a mystery, but it's likely they always knew it as Kush. The name Nubia might have come later, possibly from the Egyptian word for gold, nub, since the region was rich in this precious metal. Or, it could have been named after the Noba or Nuba people who lived there. The city of Kerma, which became powerful enough to challenge Egypt, was the center of the early Kushite culture. It was built around a massive structure called a Dafufa, which was a sort of religious fortress made from mud brick. These Dafufas were likely the heart of the city, where important ceremonies took place. The Kerma culture thrived between 2400 and 1500 BCE and maintained a strong trading relationship with Egypt, despite occasional conflicts. However, things changed when the Egyptian pharaohs like Mentehotep II conquered the region. Even though Kerma remained a bustling city, it was eventually threatened by both the Kushites and the Hyksos during Egypt's second intermediate period. But when Amosfet came to power, he defeated the Hyksos and then turned his attention to Kush, eventually leading to the decline of the Kerma period around 1500 BCE. Afterward, Thutmose III founded the city of Napata, solidifying Egyptian control over the region. And now let's zoom in on the city of Napata, which was not just the capital but also the heart of the Kushite civilization. From its early days, Napata was heavily influenced by Egyptian culture. The rulers of Kush were buried in pyramid tombs, much like the Egyptians, and their graves were filled with Egyptian artifacts. This makes it tough for historians to date some of these burials because a Kushite king might have been buried with items that were centuries older than he was. Napata became a wealthy city, thanks in large part to trade. And it wasn't just any old city, it was the religious center of the entire region. One of the key figures in making Napata so important was the Egyptian pharaoh Thutmose III. He built the Great Temple of Amun at the foot of the nearby Jebel Barkal Mountain, 
which would remain the most significant religious site in Kush for centuries. Later pharaohs like Ramses II also contributed to the temple, and as time went on, the priests of Amun gained considerable political power over the Kushite rulers, much like they did in Egypt. As Egypt's new kingdom started to decline around 1069 BCE, Napata emerged as a strong, independent political entity. By this time, Egypt was split, with the high priest of Amun ruling Upper Egypt from Thebes, while the pharaoh ruled Lower Egypt from Tanis. This division made Egypt weak, and Kush saw an opportunity to rise without having to worry about Egyptian interference. Napata was chosen as the capital of the new kingdom of Kush, and from there the kingdom expanded its trade networks far beyond Egypt. Initially, the Kushite kings were still buried in the older city of Kerma, but eventually, Napata became the site of the royal necropolis. The kingdom grew stronger and more powerful, but when they finally moved into Egypt, it wasn't as invaders, they came as rulers looking to preserve and even revive Egyptian culture. This brings us to the 25th dynasty, when the Kushites ruled Egypt. During Egypt's third intermediate period, while Egypt was losing its wealth and prestige, Kush was thriving. The first Kushite king we know by name, Alara, united the kingdom and centralized religious practices in Napata. Although the exact dates of his reign are unclear, Alara became a legendary figure in Kushite history for his long and successful rule. His successor, Kushta, admired Egyptian culture so much that he started to Egyptianize Kush. As Egypt's power waned, Kushta seized the opportunity to have his daughter, Aminerdizai, appointed as God's wife of Amun in Thebes, a position of immense power. This role had become so influential that it was almost equivalent to the high priest of Amun. Aminerdi's eye took control of Thebes, and from there, Kushta declared himself the king of both Upper and Lower Egypt without even needing to raise an army. Just like that, the 25th dynasty was born, with Kushite kings ruling over Egypt. Kushta didn't enjoy his success for long, as he was succeeded by his son Pie. Unlike his father, Pie wasn't content with just declaring himself king, he marched his army north, conquering the cities of Lower Egypt. However, Pia wasn't interested in ruling from Thebes or disrupting the existing order. Instead, he let the local rulers keep their thrones as long as they acknowledged him as their overlord. After Pia came his brother Shabaka, who continued to strengthen Kushite control over Egypt, even as far north as the Delta region. Despite what some early scholars claimed, this wasn't a dark time for Egypt. By now, Kushite culture had become so Egyptianized that Shabaka respected and preserved traditional Egyptian values. He even had his son appointed as the high priest of Amun in Thebes, effectively making him the ruler of Egypt. Shabaka oversaw many building projects and restoration efforts, ensuring that Egyptian culture not only survived but thrived under Kushite rule. However, things started to get complicated when Shabaka's successor, Shabaiku, came into conflict with the Assyrians. Egypt had always maintained a buffer zone between its northern borders and Mesopotamia, but by this time, that buffer was gone. Shabaiku's support of rebellious kingdoms like Judah and Israel against the Assyrians eventually led to the Assyrian army marching into Egypt. The Assyrians under their king Esarhaddon, defeated the Kushite king Taharqa and captured his family, sending them in chains to Nineveh. Taharqa managed to escape to Napata, but the writing was on the wall. The last major Kushite ruler, Tantamani, tried to resist the Assyrians but was ultimately defeated by Ashurbanipal in 666 BCE, marking the end of the 25th dynasty, and the Assyrians installed a puppet king, Nechoi, to control Egypt. But that didn't last long. Necho's son, Sametichus I, managed to throw off Assyrian rule and establish the 26th dynasty of Egypt. Things were going pretty well under Sametichus I and his successor Necho, but then Sametichus II came along, eager to make his mark with a grand military campaign. He set his sights on Kush and led an expedition that eventually reached Napata, the heart of the Kushite kingdom. 
But after sacking towns, temples, and even Napata itself, Psammeticus too got bored and just headed back to Egypt, leaving destruction in his wake. This was around 590 BCE, and after that blow, the Kushites decided it was time to move their capital further south to Meroe. This move was strategic, meant to keep the kingdom safe from further Egyptian attacks. Even in Meroe, the kings continued to emulate Egyptian customs, fashion, and religious practices. But things were about to change in a big way under the reign of King Archimani I, also known as Ergamenes, who ruled from 295 to 275 BC. Now, Archimani, I wasn't your typical Kushite king. He had been educated in Greek philosophy, which gave him a different perspective on things. One of the most significant changes he made was breaking the power of the priests of Amun. For generations these priests had controlled the monarchy, telling each king when his time was up, essentially dictating when he had to die so a new king could be chosen. But Archimani I wasn't having any of that. He led a group of men to the temple, had the priests killed, and put an end to their control over the kingship. With the priests out of the picture, Archimani had started introducing new policies that marked a clear shift away from Egyptian influence. He abandoned the use of Egyptian hieroglyphs and instead adopted the Meroitic script, which is still a mystery to us today since it hasn't been fully deciphered. The fashion too changed during his reign, moving away from Egyptian styles to something distinctly Meroitic. Even the gods of the Egyptians were blended into the Kushite pantheon, with figures like Aptimok taking center stage. One of the most intriguing aspects of Archimania's reign was the rise of female monarchs in Meroe, known as Candaces or Kandakes. These queens ruled with real power and authority, independent of male rulers. The first of these powerful women we know of was Queen Shanekdekedi, who led her troops into battle around 170 BC. The term, Candace, is believed to mean Queen Mother, but the exact meaning is still up for debate. What's clear though, is that these queens weren't defined by their relationships with men, they were monarchs in their own right. One of the most famous Candaces was Queen Amenirines, who successfully led her people during the Meroitic War against Rome and even negotiated a favorable peace treaty with Augustus Caesar. Meroe itself was a thriving hub, both agriculturally and industrially. Situated on the banks of the Nile, the city grew wealthy through its iron industry, producing weapons, tools and other goods that were traded far and wide. The city's economy was bolstered by the export of grains and cereals, and its fields were filled with livestock. Meroe was so rich and powerful that it even caught the attention of the Persian king Cambyses II, who supposedly launched an expedition to conquer it. But according to legend, Cambyses' army never made it, defeated not by Meroe's defenses, but by the harsh terrain and weather they encountered along the way. The city itself was a sight to behold. It was surrounded by fertile fields, irrigated by canals off the Nile, and lush forests beyond. The upper class lived in grand houses and palaces, while the lower classes resided in more modest homes made of mud brick. But even the poorest citizens of Meroe were said to live better than people elsewhere. At the center of the city stood the Temple of Amun, which was considered a jewel of Meroe, rivaling even the great temple at Napata. But, like all great civilizations, Meroe's time in the sun eventually came to an end. In 330 CE, the Aksumites invaded and sacked the city. Although Meroe held on for another 20 years, the writing was on the wall. The city had been doomed by its own success. The iron industry, which had fueled its wealth, also led to massive deforestation. The surrounding forests were depleted for charcoal, and the fields were overgrazed and overused, leaving the soil exhausted. By the time the Aksumites arrived, Meroe was already in decline. When the last of its people left around 350 CE, it marked the end of the Kingdom of Kush.